from the Air Force 12. Two tight ends on the right side of the line. Halani gets the fake. Green goes to the left. 10-5. Taylor Green into the end zone for the touchdown. Beautiful fake by Green. He ends up with his seventh rushing touchdown of the season. And Boise State leads it 9-0. All be snapped from the 32-yard line. They got to get to the 27. Britton under center. He's going to throw. Britton flushed out of the pocket. Chased by Simpson. Simpson got it from behind. What a tackle by Andrew Simpson. Green gets the high snap. Hands it off to Jetty up the middle. Breaks clear. Nobody's going to catch him. Aston Jetty again. Aston Jetty, 50-yard run up the middle. They blew the defensive line out at the point of attack. There was nobody home in the middle, and nobody was catching Genty. Huge run, 10.51 to go. It's 23 to 12. What's going on, guys? Happy championship week. Anybody? No juice back here? I just, I'm the only one? No, but uh, just so excited for our players. Um, you know, on pins and needles through Saturday night into Sunday morning. I'm um, just so proud of our team and what they've been able to accomplish the past two weeks to find a way to get into this championship game and have a shot to go play for a championship and bring this trophy back to Boise Idaho. So hats off to our players, our staff. I'm um, just so excited that, that we're back. It is hard to match the energy and enthusiasm of interim head coach Spencer Danielson, but we're going to do our best. It is championship week for the Boise State football team. This is the reason why you sign up to play for the Broncos. And if you are good enough to get a ring, you join that elite fraternity. How many you got? Yeah, two. two rings for Shane Williams Rhodes, the former Boise State legendary pass catcher. Welcome on into Jay Sports Bar, Jay Tust, alongside Shane Williams Rhodes. The Boise State football team has done it. They have navigated what seemed like was the impossible. They got a little help from the outside and then took care of their own business. And through all this, it has certainly galvanized the team. And now, Shane, they are going to get a chance to go out and play for a Mountain West Conference championship this Saturday in Las Vegas. I hate to say I didn't think we were going to be here, but I thought we were going to win out anyway. So it's good to see that we found a way to make it work. The energy right now is is top tier. I don't know. It's been a while since you've seen that. Yes, the Boise State football team has won the games that they have had to win. But there has been so much outside of it that has fallen in their favor that has allowed them to get to this point, right? We mentioned it last week on the show. Uh, New Mexico, a near three-touchdown underdog, goes and wins at Fresno. Uh, one week prior to that, it was Air Force going down to Hawaii and losing as a three-touchdown favorite. If you combine both those things happening, it's like an 87-1 to odd of actually coming to fruition. And with that happening, with Boise State winning their football games three weeks ago, 3.1% odds of winning the Mountain West conference championship have now turned into being a three-point favorite in the mountain west conference championship i mean like it is just insane to see how quickly this thing has swung in favor of the blue and orange yeah well, i don't even think people realize this though but last time we were you know lost five games uh the state of the team was terrible obviously mm -hmm. um we also lost a coach that year uh you know you finish the year when a coach leaves before the bowl game uh, the team just kind of falls apart. There's a lot going on. Uh, the the fans obviously didn't love it. You know, we mm -hmm. lost five games. We were eight and five. It just it looked terrible. And then you have this team. They have a chance to go eight and five, and they're about to play for a championship mm -hmm. game. And they lost a coach. So it's just seeing those two situations where you lose coaches. We lost our coach, and we kind of fell apart. Mm -hmm. This team here is – getting better as and coming together so it's it's really cool to see yeah being on both ends of those it, it's crazy that's a, that's such a good juxtaposition there because i was here in 2013 it was one of my first seasons covering the boise state football team and when chris peterson left for much different circumstances than uh you know andy avalos being dismissed but when chris peterson left it felt like the sky had fallen the program had been delivered a gut punch uh, 105 times to everybody in that locker room and i remember being outside the football facilities everybody was kind of leaving and it just seemed like again the, the world had ended and now it's like 
a season that, of lost hope has turned into this rejuvenated season that anything is possible. And right now, anything is possible, including what I have called potentially the best season since 2007. That was the last time Boise State won a Mountain West Conference championship and then went on to went on to win a significant bowl game. It was the Las Vegas Bowl. Now it is the L.A. Bowl. And Boise State still has a chance to check both of those boxes. And it begins this week. I think that what you brought up right there, Shane, also shows the job that Spencer Danielson is doing. It's it's like I've almost even forgotten about the first 10 games of the season at this point. Yeah, you're 100% correct because I almost for a second there couldn't even tell you who was our interim coach when Pete left because of how chaotic things mm-hmm. were. It's just, you know, we were at the bowl game and it was just very chaotic. Guys were all over the place, practices all over the place, and, you know, half the coaching staff was gone anyway. So it's just – these guys are have stuck around and they're they're pulling it out and it's just it's crazy to see like just being part of how that happened before mm-hmm. it's crazy to see how 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 they're panning out. I believe it was Bob Gregory that was the interim head yeah, coach. It was okay. I think we found out some significant news when it comes to the coaching search this week. Last Saturday, Jeremiah told us on Bronco Roundup Game Day that he was getting really really close to identifying the finalists for this position. And just yesterday, on Tuesday, he said that he had met every single candidate or every single finalist in person. And so now it seems like we are really getting close to this thing. One of those finalists we know, and it's because he's the interim head coach over at Boise State. Spencer Danielson has interviewed for the permanent position, and he uh, gave us the details on that earlier this week. The coaching search has, has become pretty transparent with what Boise State is doing, and uh, they're talking about in-person interviews and meeting with people and, and uh, getting really close to identifying the finalists. I'm just curious, is there any update on your status as you continue to, to pursue this, this vacancy? Yeah, Jay, me and the leadership, Jeremiah, you know, we had a really good conversation yesterday and went, went through a lot of the process together yesterday. But obviously with the fact that we're playing a championship game, they were respectful of times. We had a great conversation and then um, came back to work and had a staff meeting and focused on UNLV. So respect, and that's really about where I'm going to leave it right now. But we had a great conversation yesterday um, with them, with together on, on – about myself and, my, and the vision for this program, if, it, if that's where, where they want to go with. And then I came back and led this team. So that's where we're at. Would you call that an interview? Spencer? Yeah, it was. Okay. No, it was. Yeah, and like I said, I'll be open to the guys that it was. And, and at the end of the day, that's where we left it. And I'm excited for this week. Jeremiah Dickey said it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when you'll become a head coach. He reiterated that on our pregame show on Saturday. Chris Peterson on Fox, I don't know if you saw it or not, but he essentially said something very, very similar about about you. Um, how do you prove that when has arrived when we, you're no longer worrying about if? Yeah, no, and Jay, that's a great question. And I mean, I mean, my, through this whole process, right, obviously we've talked about how much these players, this place mean to my heart and how much I feel cold here. Right, I legitimately feel called to this place, these kids, this community. But my focus from the second that I was named the interim coach was 100% focused on this team and us finishing this the right way. I had communication with our players that grown men finish what they start. We're going to do this together. And so that has been my focus. It is. It, it truly, from my heart, has not been to prove that I'm ready to be a head coach. It has been to focus on these players and finish what they started as a senior group and as the 2023 Broncos. That's been my focus. If that is enough, if that proves that I am ready to who who needs that, then that, that fires me up and I'm ready for it. If it doesn't, then God's got other plans. But my focus is this team. And so I do not wake up every day and trying to be somebody I'm not trying to do something that someone will look at and approve of. I'm doing everything that I'm passionate about in my heart, in my soul, that is going to put these players in the best possible situation on and off the field. Because that is me. That's my motivation. That's my passion, is these young men. And I'm a firm believer that that will create greatness not only in their lives, but on the football field, and excited to do that. The cool thing about Spencer's message, and he stays so consistent with this, is that he is interviewing and applying for the job of his lifetime. I mean, this is something he wants so badly. His players want this for him. But I love his message of, you know what? I'm going to uh, be who I am. 
I am not going to necessarily worry about trying to impress somebody to get this job, but rather I'm going to continue to pour everything I can into my players. And if that is good enough, then that's good enough for Spencer Danielson, whether he gets the job or doesn't get the job. The thing for, for Spencer, he's going to go out of this thing without with zero regrets, I think. Personally, I think. I mean, like if, if he doesn't get this job, I don't think it's I don't necessarily think it's him. I think it's because Jeremiah Dickey has identified somebody that he believes is is just better for the position. And I I, I that would be good for Boise State football because I think the world of Spencer Danielson at this point. If we're going to be honest about this, if he doesn't get this job, this doesn't mean he doesn't get another head coaching job because you go out and on your resume you're able to say, you know, I'm 4-0, four, 5-0. Four and oh, I won a Mountain West Championship game as a head coach. That's really hard for someone to pass up at a, you know, at a different school depending mm-hmm. on what school that is, uh, whether it be a MAC school or those kind of schools. But – like that's a great resume to have. You're undefeated as a head coach, and you won a championship as a head coach. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, either way, I think it's going to work out for him. I have never seen this type of support though for a head coach. I, I, I really, I mean, even like, I mean, I, I go back and I th- think when Chris Peterson left, I, I, I guess it's, it was a very different type of support. But I mean, these players are so vocal, openly in interviews. They are all like, "Nah, I'll run through a wall for Spencer Danielson. We want Spencer Danielson to be our leader." Um, there was, you know, Ahmed Hassanin yesterday said, it, you know, he, he definitely plans on coming back to Boise State. If Spencer Danielson is here, he's absolutely coming back to Boise State. I don't want to interpret that as Ahmed's looking to leave, by the way. I don't want to interpret that. that. That shouldn't be interpreted that way at all. Yeah. But you could just feel like the, the passion he feels towards Spencer Danielson and playing for Spencer Danielson. He went on to say, like, when I grow up, I want to be like Spencer Danielson and how he treats people. And I, that, all that stuff is just so hard for me to ignore as he chases this this position. Yeah, it's when you have when you have this going on in the program, it just kind of makes you reflect a little bit about you know how the first seven or eight weeks went in the program and in the building with how much fun you just see the kids are having now. I feel like they their energy on the field and even off the field in interviews is just everything's totally different. So mm-hmm. you know, I kind of. Kind of feel bad for Andy just with how yeah. things have flipped around, you know, so fast. Because usually it takes, you know, the whole coaching staff getting fired, a new coaching staff comes in, they create this new energy, and they probably preach that change is good. Because I know, you know, that's what we got when we got a new coach. And uh, to say that, you know, the head of the snake was kind of, kind of cut off and. Mm-hmm. Nothing else changed, and the entire program has changed. It just it it doesn't look great on that end for mm-hmm. him. I mean, there was a common denominator. Yeah. Unfortunately, there there was. I man, he was a heck of a recruiter. He definitely got some talent here, and I will absolutely tip my cap to him for that because that that's something you can't take away. These are the same players that that he coached, and some of them are, are sure they're playing a little bit better. But you look at a guy like Andrew Simpson, he started to really turn it on you know, six weeks ago, even when Andy was mm-hmm. still here. So I don't want to completely dismiss, the fact, dismiss that fact. But what Spencer's doing is, is really, really cool. And the leaders that are speaking up, DJ Schramm, a sixth-year senior captain, said earlier this week that they met with Jeremiah Dickey weeks ago, and they expressed how they felt about Spencer Danielson getting the permanent head coaching job. And yesterday when we caught up with, with DJ, he kind of elaborated on it. I am, along with the other 109 guys in that locker room, he has done such, such an awesome job and the relationship he builds, not just with guys on defense, but guys on offense. I mean, the guys in that locker room, they love playing for him. And uh, I think we're going to show that on Saturday as well. We have heard Jeremiah say a couple of times, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when mm-hmm. Spencer will get an opportunity to be a head coach somewhere. Why do you think when is now? Um, just because of the man he is and the leader he is. Uh, I mean, he is uh, a younger coach, but he has an impact on everyone in our building. Everyone in that locker room, the coaches upstairs, I mean, he makes everyone around him better every single day. So I think that's why he's ready. Shane, one through 109 in the locker room, DJ Schramm says. And there are guys when they speak up, and I'm like, is it really one through 109? But DJ Schramm's one of those dudes that I feel like he's got a great pulse of the locker room, mostly because everybody looks up to him. I mean, he is the modern-day Avery Williams, where everybody's just trying to be like him, uh, repeat his process, and and learn from him. And so when, when DJ says something like this, all of a sudden my ears perk up just a little bit more, and I start to believe everything just a little bit more. Here's my biggest deal on this whole thing Mm -hmm. is we got all these guys and it seems like right now uh, Spencer has nothing but 
pros, no cons as far as uh, as far as being the head coach. The only other thing the players have to realize is him probably being the head coach next year means he's no longer the DC, mm-hmm. so that could change the dynamic of some things. Yeah, uh, you know, obviously, I feel like uh, to me, I feel like Avalos kind of wanted some of that control, you know, to be mm-hmm. able to do that too, but. Yeah, it's a you know it's it's different just being only a head coach and not just a coordinator. So right now I feel like Spencer's in the perfect position because he's able to have control mm-hmm. over something while also leading the team. That is a good point because he is calling plays from the mm-hmm. sideline still as a defensive coordinator, and I think that it would have been weird to maybe uh, give up that duty ten games into the season. It would have been I guess the eleventh game of the season. It was mm-hmm. technically his first as interim head coach backslash defensive coordinator. So he has called plays from the sideline. The results have been pretty good so far. Yeah, the kids and obviously the fan base have to understand though that dynamic will change. Mm. You know, uh, his duties change, everything changes, and then obviously. Uh, with the old NIL deals, uh, the dynamic of our team will change next year, uh, not even including the incoming guys. Mm Because I know Spencer's done a good job of getting guys already since he's just had this – short tenure dude he's gotten uh, a handful of verbal commits as an interim head coach Mm -hmm. and i asked him about this i I wasn't going to play this bite but i I was curious how is this happening so after last game i I took my shot and i asked him and well here's what he had to say these young men call our staff call me and say coach i'm watching what's going on i want to be a part of it family same way coach we want to be a part of it we believe in what you guys are doing we're in and i said come on let's roll because these are young men that we've obviously been recruiting, we've known about, that we know fit this place, that fit this culture, that fit this community. And them being all in, even with this uncertainty, they belong here. And so I said, let's go. Let's go to work. And it's been exciting. We've got a couple more coming too, hopefully. So obviously Spencer can't comment on like the specifics of, of who is verbally committing. Yeah. That's against NCAA rules. But – you can still talk about it vaguely and the number of guys that you've got to commit. And he's had three verbal commits since he has been the interim head coach. And as he said right there, he's hoping to get a couple more on board. This is, you know, you look around college football and you see all the head coaching changes and there is like a mass exodus of players that leave a program when there is a change at Mm -hmm. the top. Uh, we've said it before, I'll mention it again, when there is a head coaching change, the transfer portal opens immediately for that school. You do not have to wait until December 4th. And so you look around and like, um, there was a head coach fired earlier this week and nine guys immediately said, I'm out. I'm, I'm, I'm entering the portal, I'm out of here. Spencer and company, they haven't lost one. Um, if you want to say Eric McAllister, I guess you could say Eric McAllister, but that technically started to evolve before the change was made with Andy Avalos, uh, you know, being dismissed and, and Spencer Danison taking over. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily going to put that on, on Spencer. Definitely um, can't because he tried to come back when Spencer yep, got hired. Right. So, yeah. I saw Eric on the sideline this last weekend, and he said that he's – He's moving on. Like this is he sure, sure he tried to come back. I have various sources that said this. Uh, I think even actually Spencer came out and said this at one point in time. Like we got our group right now. And we just want to kind of focus on these guys and and and, and the family we have in our locker room right now. And you know I, I think that there was some there were definitely probably some people that said nah welcome Emac back. But I think there were more people that they kind of saw it for what it was. And it's tough, man. Like. I don't want to say he quit on his team, but he left the program in the middle of the season, man. And I know that he was dealing with a lot. And as he said that, you know, he did what a lot of his teammates wanted to do, however accurate that was, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he's, he's going to move on. I'm not putting that on Spence's resume, though, yep. uh, by any means. And so not only has he won games, he's kept all of this together. Yes, I think that football has served as a big-time distraction. I wonder what it would look like this week, Shane, if Boise State wasn't playing in a Mountain West Conference championship game. For sure. Would guys have started to kind of uh, explore the portal? This is – even if it does happen with some, some players after the championship game, um, before the bowl game, after the bowl game, this is modern-era college football. Like, you are going to have guys that want to go out and just seek the best option. You are going to have guys that wonder if the best option for them is here. Is There still is a question mark at the top with, with leadership – because we don't know who the permanent head football coach is. So if you want to test out the portal, see if anybody wants to offer you a better position, pay you a little more money, whatever it might be, that is the freedom that college football is allowing these, these student athletes to test, um, test these days that you know previously had never existed. Yeah, you know, I think the person that's really on the, 
that really has all the eyes on him right now is uh, is Dicky because the decision he makes at the top here after this championship game, whether we win or lose, um, the decision that he makes on head coach is gonna make a lot of decisions for a lot of these kids. Like you said, uh, they haven't nobody's left yet, but let's say they go out and win the championship game, and then they hire someone new. Mm -hmm. I assume, obviously, you know, uh, Spencer will still finish out the season as the head coach. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if a lot of these kids will stay. You know, I mean, if you know, okay, he's not coming back next year. At this point, the kids in their minds are thinking, well, the portal's open now for me. Guys are going to start getting picked up. So mm -hmm. I have to get in there so I can have a better opportunity because obviously the longer you're in there, the better chance you have, yep. you know. So I think that can change some things versus if – He's hired as the you know the permanent coach. I think you get less kids that jump in, but I also do. I'm not naive, and I know that this 109 that we have will not be the 109 we have next year. Correct. There's going to be some guys that are going to be gone. So uh, I know they all love him, but I'm not sure how many we get back. Mm -hmm. I think that he's a key piece to this. I think that he means a lot to this program. If he's not hired as the head coach, I think the question now becomes. How do you try to, to to retain Spencer Danielson? And I, I don't know if it's – I mean, sure, it might be more money. It, it might be an associate head coach title. I, I don't know what it is. But he has made it very clear that he wants to become a head coach one day. And I liken this to an, another guy that uh, – different sport, similar scenario. Scott Garson, he was the former College of Idaho head basketball coach. And, man, he turned that program into a national contender. And now Colby Blaine has just taken it to another level. But he was the right-hand man to Ben Howland at UCLA. Like, I mean, it doesn't – few few benches get be bigger or better than that, right? Yeah. And he was the right-hand man to Ben Howland. But in order to become a head coach, he felt like he had to go get, get that experience somewhere. So that's what that's why he ended up in Caldwell, Idaho, Idaho for a few years, getting that leadership, being the guy with the whistle around your neck, calling the timeouts, like trying to get experience in that role. Now, he left College of Idaho and returned to the Division One level, not as a head coach. He's still waiting for that opportunity. But how does this relate to Spencer Danielson? Like, if he hasn't been able to earn or be elevated to head coach yet, he's got to ask himself, how does he do that if that's something he so passionately wants? Is that here at Boise State? It hasn't been the last two times he's been named interim head coach. So will he have to get uncomfortable and leave in order to achieve that? If he does, like somebody tweeted at me this week, like, well, that, apparently he wouldn't love the players that much if he did that. Dude, this guy's turned down so many opportunities to leave Boise State that would offer him so much more money than he makes here. Like, I'm letting you know that's just a stupid comment to make. Mm -hmm. Don't don't yeah. think that of Spencer Danielson. If he leaves, it's just because he has to. Yeah. I mean, everybody's got goals. Mm -hmm. You know, he, everyone's outside looking in. They, they don't know what, obviously, he's going through, what he's been through. But that just goes back to what I was saying, that – Basically, for him, it's an interview for Boise State, obviously, to try to get in. But if he doesn't get this job, that doesn't mean he's not going to get another one. Man, look at it like this. If he were to go 4-0 and through this, throughout this whole thing as interim head coach with a Mountain West Conference championship and a bowl victory over a Pac-12 school. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are still big ifs we got to accomplish yeah. here, you know, or Boise State has to accomplish here. If he were to do that, though, you're telling me there's not another program out there that would be like, okay – I've yep. seen enough. I want him. Yep. I, I totally agree. That's literally – that's what I'm saying. Like, it's a lot that's going to go into this. This is going to be an interesting uh, two weeks here we have in front of us. Very interesting. Between the Mountain West Championship, the new coach, all of it. Mm -hmm. The transfer portal, it's going to be uh, – I just I – I miss the day, Shane, where, you know, we could sit down after football season and we could just get – we could just get ready for – Christmas Sign, signing day, you know, at that but, point, it just it all goes to recruits now, you know, it was signing day in February, though. <laughs> now we got signing day in the De middle of December. December. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I miss the days, like I said, where it was just like, oh, we're through the regular season. We'll get through the bowl game and then we yep. will just kind of kick back for a couple of weeks or some well earned time away from our jobs, I personally believe. But now the December is as loaded as any month on the football calendar because of Bowl games, Mountain West Championships, transfer portal opening up, signing day. I mean, December has just become insane. And, I mean, this December, obviously, for Boise State fans, it's probably one of the biggest because – Head coaching job and – You got the head coaching it. job. 
But then you also currently have your highest rated player ever to commit to Boise State. Dallin who, Bear. Who will be signing in the middle of December. So it's just a mm -hmm. lot that are that's hanging in the wind right now. Still verbally committed at the moment. Yes. Um, but he has said, you know, we, we uh, reached out to his football coach in, at Burley High School a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, he said he's exploring the process. So uh, I don't I don't even at that time. I mean, we know he's still verbally committed, but what that means, I don't know if he's still going on visits to Oregon they, and Michigan. They, they, and, and they're he, throwing all the stops right now. Exactly. I think Which, I'm pretty sure he was just at the game this week. He was. He was at Michigan. He That's, got to see the Wolverines knock off Ohio <laughs> State. They're pulling out all the stops mm -hmm. at this point. So that's why I said these next two weeks are huge. They're huge. Shifting our focus, I guess, back to the, the product on the field. Ashton Genty, the 2023 Mountain West Offensive Player of the Year, a title that was well earned. Uh, he led the league in yards from scrimmage. Heck, he leads the nation in yards from scrimmage per game at over 164. He led the league in rushing yards per game. He was second in total touchdowns. He was first in offensive plays of 10 or more yards with 49. He is the most explosive player, I think, personally. in may, uh, Man. Go ahead, say it. College football? Go, go definitely ahead. in the Mountain West. But running back for sure. I think there are some other wide receivers, the kid from Oregon. Like, I mean, there, there are some guys out there that I, I don't want to, like, you know, completely just seem like I'm a homer and go all in on Ashton Genty here. But I, I got to tell you, man, if I was to, if this was a college football draft, mm -hmm. I, outside of a few quarterbacks, man, Ashton Genty would be so high on my board. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I'm assuming he's probably number one on the draft board for next year. He's, I mean, you mean like, yeah. Well, NIL has its own probably secret draft board. Well, that that's a whole nother, yeah. That's that's going to be a lot of money. These QBs get a lot of money. I mean, there was a report that came out yesterday, I believe, about Cam Ward, the Washington State quarterback. How do you feel about that? I'm, I'm bummed, but I don't know what else to do. Like, I don't fault the kid. If he, they, so There was a report that said he has 10 different $1 million offers to go elsewhere. The one that hurts is Washington. Yeah, I was about to say, how do you feel about that, UW that, offering? That, that, that one hurts. And I really don't question if UW can go that high because – I got a pretty good source that says Michael Penix Jr. is well over that mark at this moment. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, him and Rome, I believe, are the first two Adidas athletes mm -hmm. in college. Yeah, so that's – we won't even – they haven't even counted that money yet. Yeah, that that hurts me. But I also look at it from this perspective, man. Like, even if, even if Washington State could pay him a million bucks and say, man, stay in Pullman, this might sound like a weird question, but is that really even worth it to Washington State? Like you're gonna pay a kid a million bucks to to fight to go to a bowl game, or are you gonna again? Well, gosh, this is like I'm 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 making my own self you mad also here. Remember what conference? How the conference deals work, and that's we don't even know. Yeah, for, I think for, that for obviously think that obviously affected Smitty here. Yeah, who's out? I would assume so. Yeah, I couldn't believe he left, but I understand why he left. Yeah, I mean I don't even know how many times we've said this over these last few weeks. This is just college football today. So that sucks. It does. Like I, but I also am a realist and I get like if if somebody offered my son one day a million dollars to go play college football, he, what would you do if he said no and wanted to stay where he was? Are you sure? <laughs> I think it's time to make some executive decisions yeah, in, right? that, in that household. A million bucks is life changing money. Now I think I that Ashton Genty is in a point too. I'm not giving advice to Ashton Genty because I am in nowhere – I am not in the position to even think about doing that. But if you are Ashton Genty, you know that you are draft eligible next year. Mm -hmm. That's something you really have to weigh. Like, do you want to go to the SEC and, and get that money right now? Or do you want to maybe stay at a school like Boise State, be super productive once again, and now all of a sudden when you go off into the NFL, you see all this production, you're still a true junior, so the wear and tear is still okay on your body. That's not going to be held against you. And all of a sudden now you land in like a second round where now all, you know, your $1 million that you could have gotten at an SEC school is turning into four, five, six million dollars $6 million and some type of guaranteed payout at, at the NFL level. I mean, those, those are things you have to weigh, and he is so darn close to that. It's unfortunate he can't go chase that this year because, man – I'd give him a chance in the NFL. I was like a little skeptical, skeptical about really diving into that earlier this season, but I have seen enough. For sure. I, the, the thing I will say I've loved is the fan base. I think I've seen a ton of people online saying, you know, 
I get it if he leaves. Like they typically, you know how the, the fans can yeah. be, but they all understand that we have the best back. And for him not to leave, for someone to say, "Hey, here's one point two million dollars," and we know that in the NFL they don't pay backs, which is another factor in that. So it's just like why a lot of people have been very accepting, even mm-hmm. though he hasn't said that he was leaving. They've been accepting of it. That's life changing money. And if you got a good financial planner, mm-hmm. I mean, that's something that could impact you for the next few decades of your life. And if you do it right, heck, that type of money can turn into generational wealth too. If you do sure. it right. On a more controversial topic, so he wins 2023 Mountain West Offensive Player of the Year. Thank God. I was a little on edge this week. I put him first on my ballot, clearly. I was a little on edge, though, because last week the Doak Walker Award released their list of finalists. And I keep going down. I'm like, oh, maybe they're just not doing alphabetical order this year. Well, it seems like it's an alphabetical order. And I get to the bottom, and there's no Ashton Genty. Makes no sense. That is so dumb. And I'm really not, like, I don't try to get too caught up in, like, these awards and stuff like that. But my goodness, if, if your job is to honor the best running back in the country and you have not acknowledged or watched Ashton Genty. Top three in every category. Then what are, you, what are we doing? Every, like, what, what is this category. award even about? Is there a category he's not top three in? Not significantly. I mean, especially if you're going off, I guess it's like rushing yards per game is not top three. But I'll throw this at you. He's the first running back. He is the first player in college football with over 1,000 yards rushing and over 500 yards receiving in a single season since 2019. I mean, we're talking about not the most versatile season this year by a running back or a player in the FBS, Shane. We are talking about the most impressive season, the most versatile season by an FBS player in, in four or five years. Mm-hmm. It, it makes no sense to me. And that all this being said is without him playing two games. Exactly. Which is crazy. It's crazy. So I, I asked Genty after last game if it was any type of motivation for him, and, and he gave me the whole, I'm not about personal awards. I want the team to win. A Mountain West championship means more to me. And then at the end, he kind of said, was it maybe a little motivation? Sure. And then he kind of went back to, like, the team stuff. <laughs> it was a whole lot of motivation. Come Pretty on now. Sure. Yeah. A little salty. I, yeah. need, I need him to not make another award so he can bring it this week. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, maybe he should have got snubbed for Mountain West Offensive Player <laughs> of the Year. Then he'll go get 225 yep. all-purpose yards again. It's needed. We're going to need it this week. It's well, a big one. I, so, I, Ashton wouldn't really go into it, but I did ask Spencer Danielson, and uh, the old ball coach was, was pretty fired up that Ashton was left off that list. I watch a lot of tailbacks. I watch Ashton Genty every day. Absolutely he is. He deserves to be on that list. I don't know why he's not. He missed two and a half games, but the production he has, he's the leading, um, he's leading all college football in yards from scrimmage. Why he's not on that list, I can't answer that, but he deserves to be on there without question. I mean, if you follow me on Twitter, you know my take on this. I think I have tweeted at the Doak Walker Award uh, probably a dozen times this last week. A number of them were actually in the game as Ashton continued to do amazing thing after amazing thing. A 75-yard screen pass that he turned into a touchdown. Uh, I should say a screen pass that he turned into a 75-yard touchdown with 77 yak on the play. He also had a 50-yard rushing touchdown. Um, he had two out of Boise State's, uh, you know, three offensive touchdowns in the game and put the team on his back yet again. And this is two weeks removed from missing two and a half games. And actually, it was more than two and a half games. It was like two and three quarter games yeah. because he missed the whole second quarter against mm-hmm. Wyoming as well. He, he's back and he's as good as ever, and I know that he's going to be motivated to finish this thing strong in Las Vegas this week. All right, here we go. It's time. Mm-hmm. Top three. Boise State running backs ever. We'll say this because okay. I know it's always a few stipulations with these. I know some things can kind of sway you one way or the other, okay. so we'll go. You can omit draft posi- draft position mm-hmm. where they're picked. You can omit everything, just period. You can – if you had a draft, and let's just say – let's give a random quarterback that way. Let's say your quarterback's Brett Rippon, mm-hmm. and you have to put a running back back there with him. Who are you, who are you going with? Oh. One, two – who's the starter? Who's the backup? If it's, if it's Brett Rippon, yep. I mean, Jay Ajayi was a little more downhill. Mm-hmm. 
And I, up until maybe last week or two weeks ago or whatever, I probably would have fought in somebody over this. Like I'm very adamant that Jay Ajay is number one. <laughs> but man, after that 75 yard screen pass touchdown, I, I think if I'm if I'm taking if this is a fantasy draft of Boise State running backs, there you go. I'm, I'm taking Ashton Genty number one overall. So who are you getting in the second round? I'm getting Jay. Jay's Jay's two. So who's three? That's a tough one because I know that there's going to be people listening to this that are going to say like Brock Forsey, which that that's fine. I'm cool with that. Mm-hmm. That that era was a little bit before me and how how well I really knew the Broncos in terms of just like the eye test and, and what I know. Um, fantasy wise, I'm probably taking J Mac. If I'm looking to if I'm looking to have an NFL team, I think Alexander would actually be third on that list just because Alexander was so good in the box short yarded situations he had that, like, that little quick movement which i think is really valuable in the nfl um so if it was like compiling an nfl team i may i might take madison but if it's like fantasy i'm taking uh jeremy mcnichols because he caught a lot of passes too dang no doug in there oh man <laughs> did you forget about doug no <laughs> okay you know what that's a really good point i'm sorry <laughs> I would. I think Doug is actually the best of both of those guys. Of which two? Of of Madison and J Mac. I think he's the best of both those guys. Plus, he was a little bit of a contributor on special teams. Oh yeah. Yeah, you're right. I over. I overshot that one. It's Doug. I'd go Doug at three. Doug. Yep. Yeah. Plus, if he needed to play linebacker, apparently he could do that as well. Yeah, I mean, he did start on defense. Yeah. He started out and had to switch over. So. But how insane is that? Like Doug Martin's at three. Like what? I know, and he's the he's the one that went first round. And he's the one that went first. Good point. He's that's, the one that went the first round. That's that's why I said you got to omit that. Uh, uh, my other thing with Doug, though, when I do the rankings, mm-hmm. you got to remember he had the best quarterback in in the country. It's it's it makes it a little easier when teams can't just. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, look box. at what Jinzy's doing it with people saying we're bringing him in right. the box. We know we're gonna take you throwing the ball day, mm-hmm. and he's still like just a right it. i do think that i mean i know that you know this too but i, I do think that Taylor green's athletic presence certainly you know mm-hmm. helps ashton at times i mean even on his 50 yard touchdown run I, I think it was one of the safeties that for some reason was so worried about Taylor, you know getting outside mm-hmm. that it was like the parting of the yeah blue sea or i, well, I guess it was blue and white their uniforms <laughs> uh and and he was off to the races like hardly untouched i mean that was probably the easiest run of ashton Genty's entire yeah. season I think he only just had to do a little hurdle going through the hole. Mm-hmm. Other than that, he got was skinny for a second. Out, gone. Yeah. Other guys that were honored this week um, on the All Mountain West team: Ahmed Hassanin, who has is becoming an absolute freak, and I so want to see this kid back at Boise State next year because he's only going to get better. He so much of what he is doing right now. Yes, he pays attention to detail, and and he's total. He's got a a skill set that allows him to get after the quarterback. But I still think so much of what he does is just based off of effort and, and, and pure will to get to the quarterback. Once he develops even a few more moves, like, holy cow, this guy could lead the country in sacks next year. His numbers say he'll be the next great Boise State D lineman. Yeah. Based on the numbers. I mean, he almost tracked down Mohamed Kamara of Colorado State for the sack mm-hmm. lead. Uh, he ends up finishing second behind him. He's had – Eight straight games with at least one sack. I think that it goes – the turning point for me – and it, it's really cool to see some of these guys evolve. I think it's so easy, easy to be detached from the, the humanized part of college football players at times because you watch them on TV, you, you cheer for them to score touchdowns, but I, I think that sometimes it doesn't even seem real, like these are real humans. Yeah. And I had, like, the coolest conversation with Ahmed – after the uh, North Dakota game in week three. So he didn't have a sack in either of the first two games. And, like, he almost got, like, emotional talking about it because he was like, I kept going through this process and I kept doing what the coaches told me to do and I'm not just seeing, I'm not seeing any production. And so now I'm questioning myself, like, am I doing what's right? Am I doing what I need to do to be a successful football player? And um, then all of a sudden he stuck to the process and boom. He has turned into, again, one of the best pass rushers, one of the most effective pass rushers in the country over the final two weeks, uh, two months of the season. What they don't understand is uh, at the beginning of the year, we didn't play the easiest competition. Nope, didn't. It wasn't the easiest schedule I've yeah. seen Boise State play. So that probably takes in a, you know, mm-hmm. 
an account. A little something to do with it. One of the teams is in the college football playoffs right now, so that, that, that plays a role. That helps. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, at least helps them. Hurts Ahmed. I've just been really impressed by him, his maturity, his leadership, his dedication to the process. And I asked him about it this week, and he says as he has kind of matured and grown, I, I, the five years ago, this kid is he hardly even knew what football was. He came over from Egypt, hardly even knew what football was. Now he's a first-team All-Mountain West defensive end. I asked him, how was that possible earlier this week? I kind of like leaning all into everything. It's just like taking it step by step of like, okay, on Tuesdays, Mondays, what I'm going to do on Mondays, how do I get prepared for meetings, uh, how I'm going to watch the install, how, how, how I'm going to take notes, how, how I'm going to organize my living. Old school schoolwork is a big part of it, so how I'm going to get that done so I can focus on the week and focus on football. So there's a lot of things in the process to be like, okay, I'm not going to take the day off, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. But finding my own process and just like, okay, how I'm going to come to the training room to take care of my body so I can play all 12 games, all, all 14 games. So I was just like, finding this process was a big thing for me this year. I'm curious, Shane, like at what point in time in your career did you really start to identify and learn the process that brought out the best in you, that was unique to you? Not necessarily you being like, hey, look at that older guy. That's what he does. I'm just going to do that. But you then all of a sudden said, nah, I'm gonna, I, if I tweak it this way, it's actually a little more effective for me. And I, I ask you this because I do specifically remember one time coming out of the preseason and you said you stopped kind of eating fast food or, or weeding that stuff out of your, your diet. I don't know if you're being honest with me or not. Attempted. Attempted. You know, it was, it was a try. Okay. I did try. Either way, I, I do remember that you, you – Try to do that, see the benefits of it. So at what point in time did you start to really learn that and believe in it? And then, you know, it shows up, I got 10 catches against Utah State or whatever. Okay, I'm going to do the, just keep doing this. Uh, I'd say, weirdly, weirdly enough, mine came after, um, came early. It was more like uh, fall camp and after the first game. So for me, that would have been Michigan State. Uh, because of the workload and how big the playbook was, used to be I wanted to make sure I knew as much as possible and then I told you guys before uh Matt Miller used to we used to he used to go out with me him and Prince and we used to do a walkthrough but only all the stuff I needed to know basically mm -hmm. so like all the plays I was being for and those kind of things so then what I started doing is after about three or four games when Prince and Matt realized I knew how to figure my stuff out and I, I wouldn't know what I was supposed to do I started doing it on my own so but I started doing it and I would do it with knowing every, like more everybody's plays, not just mine, mm -hmm. because then that would help me learn the whole playbook. And I would just do it at home. I would basically say, okay, just go through the whole script, because they give us the script of every play in the game, and it'd be like 160 plays or whatever. And I'd say, okay, boom, I'm at X. This is the play. Boom, boom. I have this. And then I would look back, because we have the drawings of each play in our book. And I would look back and I'm like, okay, I got it right. Then I would go back and just go through every play at X, then go through every play at Z. And then every, like, that's what I used to do. And for me, that was the biggest thing. That helped me learn the playbook faster because I was basically quizzing myself on each position. And that was one of the things about my process that was, it helped a ton. Mm -hmm. That was, it was basically because I was playing, I got thrown in the fire and it was like, you either got to piss or get out the pot. So <laughs> <laughs> I had to either learn it or not play as much so I wanted to play obviously so that was one of the things that I integrated that never thought I would have to do because I always growing up you know the plays are easy but I didn't realize the big jump of the playbook when you when I got here that was crazy along those lines Ahmed finding his process and having this success has given Boise State a dynamic game changer they sorely sorely lacked earlier in the season Andrew Simpson is also becoming that, that complimentary where they are getting after the quarterback, creating havoc, tackles for loss. Andrew, a second-team All-Mountain West guy. I had him on my first team for the linebackers. Again, I get to see him. I'm not worried he's a linebacker with you know 48 tackles on the season. I see how he impacts and wrecks the game at times. And so that is something that everybody – every. A voter out there that covers this team, I believe should have a little bit of bias because you watch that guy every single week. You see him at practice. You see how he grows. And then if everybody kind of has that approach, it all offsets, right? Yeah. 
Um, I had him on my first team. He makes second team. Getting back to the first team, though, uh, to round out the four Boise State players that were on that first team, Cade Beresford, extremely deserving. What that offensive line has done this year is as remarkable as anything that we have seen out of the Boise State football team. Every single week they have shown up, and they have been a force up front. It's true. I totally agree with that. I don't know where this team would be without Cade Beresford and the rest of that offensive line. Heck, um, Cage Casey, the left tackle, is only a redshirt freshman. He wound up on the second team. Garrett Curran, only an honorable mention. That's bogus, in my opinion. He deserved to be much higher than that. I could argue he might have been their most valuable offensive lineman this year. And they had three guys that received all Mountain West honors. And um, I don't want to go into it too much because we're not supposed to really talk about the ballot, but there were only – so many offensive linemen that linemen that Boise State nominated for their ballot. I really respect the way Boise State does their linemen, or not just their linemen awards, but their overall postseason awards. Man, there are some schools that have one of the worst defenses in the country, and I'm like, oh, why? Yeah. Why am I trying to decide if between these five defensive linemen from? Yeah. A school that's not good at defense. Mm -hmm. And so I really do respect that Boise State has a process to this and doesn't make us like, okay, good, you put them on there, and you hope that one person accidentally puts them on their ballot, and then they're on an honorable mention, which you can claim they're an all-conference player. You know? Yeah. Uh, that's that's not right, in my opinion. Um, to round this out, I know we talked about Ashton Gentry getting snubbed off the Doak Walker Award. Man, there might be one player that has a bigger beef with any voting process this year, and it is our punter. James Ferguson Reynolds leads the country in punting average by almost two yards. He wasn't <laughs> special teams player of the year in the Mountain West Conference, and he wasn't even a Ray Guy Award semifinalist. Again, he leads the country by almost two yards in punt average. He has been a game wrecker in terms of flipping field position at times. He had a 70-yarder last week against Air Force, a majestic thing of beauty. Going to get a nice bounce and a good roll. Bouncing from the 28. It's going to go down to the 8, down to the 7, and it's going to be down there. 70-yard punt. I don't mean to go over, go too far here. Ashton Genty is the MVP of the team. But if you're putting <laughs> together like a top 5, top 10 list, James Ferguson Reynolds, believe it or not, might make that list. Mm -hmm. Like He has been so valuable to this team this year. Uh, and then Jonah Dalmas, you know, this is a tough one for me. UNLV's kicker gets special teams player of the year, and he's the first team kicker. I go back to what I said, even like if this is a fantasy draft of kickers or even an NFL draft of kickers, I am 100% taking Jonah Dalmas over this guy. That being said, even my bias can't quite ignore hey, the UNLV kicker. He got more opportunities this year, which sucks because Jonah doesn't control those things. Yeah. Uh, two of Jonah's uh, three misses were blocked. I don't expect other voters uh, around the Mountain West Conference to know that. Um, so it's unfortunate, Jonah, best kicker in the league, but unfortunately, just the way things go for that, he's a second teamer. But I will I, I reiterate, I think he's the best kicker in the league. Yeah. Yeah, people don't understand how important it is to have, you know, those two positions. I, I know Boise State fans appreciate it and mm -hmm. understand it, but not it's, a lot of people do. It's one of those things where if you have it, you, you don't notice it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have it, you notice it. And if you got a poor punter that's averaging 40 yards a punt or something like that, and it's like, man, we can't ever flip field position on these guys. We're always in a tough spot. If you have a kicker that you send them out there and you're like, 42 yards? Yep. I don't know. Jonah goes out there from 52, and I'm already like punching up my tweet like, okay, up score update, Boise State, add three. <laughs> you know? he, he is so yeah. automatic. I mean, he is as automatic as anything maybe outside of Ashton Genty right now on the For Boise sure. State football team. It's true. Uh, yeah, we've had our run of – Good kickers, but mm -hmm. he is obviously breaking all the records this year, and that he they got a good old special teams coach down there right now, mm -hmm. old kicking coach, Tyler Rasa. <laughs> Doesn't get a lot of praise, and he, he's not necessarily a full time paid assistant, I believe. Mm -hmm. But I mean, come on, you can't look at the production this year and not think that he's had some type of impact on this. Yeah, yeah. I think I saw him one when I think one time Jonah was coming off, and he was he didn't even get off the field, and Tyler was already out there. They do their handshake, and he's just talking to him immediately. Tyler's one of those guys that back when he was a player here, um, he had Brian Harson kind of buying into getting iPads on the field for the, for the kickers so that during the downtime, which kickers have a lot of during practice, but after they're done kicking, they could go back and get that immediate response mm -hmm. and watch themselves so that they can go out and apply it immediately again to practice, not have to wait until after practice to get back inside the football facility. He had this mindset back then, which obviously was going to make him a great coach one day, where he's like, no, we got this downtime. We need to utilize this downtime, expedite the correction process, and now we're applying it immediately 
immediately. And um, I think that it would be silly not to give him a lot of credit. Obviously, the credit goes to the players, Jonah Dalmas and James Ferguson Reynolds. But uh, Tyler Ross's name is – it deserves to be yeah. in the discussion, especially as um, assistant coaching rosters continue to be expanded. Now there's full mm-hmm. 10 time uh, – full. 10 full-time paid assistants. You have more of those complimentary analyst roles. He's a guy that, as as those positions start to warrant more money, probably you know deserves to be in that discussion, what my I, opinion. What I say is I think it helps the players a lot when your coach can literally go out and do it and show you how mm-hmm. it's supposed to look, like live. Just right there with his leg. Right, especially at that position because for so long it was just – Oh, have one. Oh, the linebackers coach also knows some yeah, stuff we, about we special teams. One. Okay, send him over mm-hmm. there too. He'll do that. Yep. Now it's like, no, a kicker, a guy that mm-hmm. knows it, lived it, understands it, can teach it, can interpret it, can correct it, sees all those finite details of, man, like yeah. look at your plant foot. It's just a little tilted too far or something like yeah. that. Like he sees all that. And uh, that's why I think you've seen the kicking game, not even Boise State, but really across college football, start to get a little more efficient and, and, and a little better. There were 12 total Broncos that received all Mountain West awards. Uh, go to KTBB.com. We got that full breakdown for you. You can check out that story. Zach Armstrong, our uh, great digital guy, was able to get that up in a, in a hurry yesterday. Um, getting back to the game. Like I said at the top of the show, it is championship week. And the stage for this thing uh-huh. I would prefer the blue, but outside yeah. of that, it doesn't get cooler than this. You get to go down to Las Vegas, play in Allegiant Stadium, an NFL venue, and try to save your season by winning a Mountain West Conference championship. You're taking on a UNLV squad that's having their best season in a long, long time. The Rebels are 9-3, and three, but Boise State has absolutely dominated this series. They haven't lost to UNLV since 1976. They've won every single game against the Rebels in Mountain West Conference play by at least 17 points. 5-0, every win by at least 17 points. I'll caution Bronco Nation and say, this seems like a different UNLV team, but I am taking that history, I am taking that momentum, and I am taking it to... Uh, probably the sports book in Las Vegas this week. I'm just kidding. I'm not doing that. But I, I, I feel good about it, man. I, I just feel that good about it. We said the last couple of weeks, we felt Boise State was going to blow out uh, Utah State. They did. Said it against Air Force. I, hey, I know that you look it back and in the margin of victory might not have seemed yeah. like a, at a, a blowout. That game was never in doubt, though, for, for the Broncos. Yeah. And they covered the spread in that game. I'm of that mindset again here. I think they go down and they hammer UNLV. Boise State money line. I think it's one minus one forty-five. Yep, I've already taken it. Oh, okay. All oh, right. Oh, okay. Well, you Georgia, already got you already got the action there. Georgia money line, Boise State money line parlay. Okay. Yep. We're Georgia ready. over Georgia over Bama. I think what Georgia's like a five-point favorite. It's gonna be a tough one. Boise though. State a three-point favorite. I think Bama's got a tougher game than we have. I'm sorry. I think Georgia has a tougher game than we have. Taking on Bama. Well, yeah. I think huh? Bama's gonna bring. <laughs> I think Bama's gonna bring. I know a lot of people think that that game is gonna be a little bit. Wider margin, but I think I think it's Nick, Saban's it's gonna, Nick Saban. Come old on, Saban's gonna bring it to him. Yeah, I believe in the magic of this football team and everything that's going on right now. Uh, Taylor Green proving he's tough this week. Uh, he he bounced back last week. I love this little stretch of football um, that Bush Hamden kind of you know I w- I would say. You know, not not forced upon Taylor Green, but said, man, this is why I believe you're a dude. So Taylor goes out and he throws the interception in the end zone near the end of the first quarter. And that next series, they come out. Taylor hits a, a couple of seam routes to his tight end. And then he makes this beautiful corner throw. It might have been his best throw of the season to Matt Louder over on the sideline. And it was like Bush Hamden was like, man, I know you threw the pick, but I believe in you. And we're going to come back out and we're going to attack. And I'm going to have that confidence in you. And Taylor went out and he did it. And then he caps that drive. With that little touchdown run, the true freshman tied in. Uh, Matt Wagner picks it up. Nice block. They had Air Force had no chance at, at containment there, yeah. and Taylor takes it in for a touchdown. I just I loved that drive. Uh, I loved Bush's play calling on that drive. I love the confidence that he uh, you know instilled in his quarterback. I love the execution from Taylor Green. I just that was probably my favorite drive of the game. Yeah, I think Bush has done a great job. The biggest thing I liked is all the swing routes. They're mm-hmm. such easy throws for Taylor, and it's obviously it's Genty catching him. It's a sweep. That's all yeah. it is. It's a freaking sweep. But Genty in space, you take. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's a extend it's an extension of the run game. That's all it is. And but you're giving Genty more space. Mm-hmm. You're putting him out there on corners and safeties, and he doesn't have to worry about linebackers. So 
which is where you saw him score. He just runs a swing route. He's out. I'm so interested to see how UNLV tries to counter this. Um, Barry Odom and Bush Hamden have had some battles from from you know previous years in the same conference together. Uh, his defenses are kind of exotic. They're unpredictable. He's done a good job. If you look at their overall numbers, they're really not great in anything, but they're pretty good in a lot of stuff. They don't really scare me, but they're but they do enough to not necessarily make you feel you know super easy going into the contest. Yeah. And he's good enough to where I wonder, man, when two's on the field, how do they eliminate him and make somebody else beat him? Austin Bolt, Prince Strawn, they, they probably need a little bit more out of those guys. I don't know if they're, they're not, they haven't necessarily been asked to do a ton so far, no. but this is kind of one of those weeks where you probably need one of those guys to make that type of big play. Yep. And I'm not even talking about getting behind the defense for a 50 yard touchdown. I mean, great, that'd be yeah. awesome. But it's just kind of like, at some point in time, they're going to need a tough third down catch. Yeah. Who can Talon go to and get that thing, move the chains, and give Ashton Genty another shot to hit a home run? Yeah, here's where I stand on the game. I don't think UNLV can stop Ashton Genty. I, I don't either. UNLV's rush defense isn't bad. It's like it's fourth in the conference at a little under 150 a game. Man, I'm, Boise State's rushing for like 250, if, 275. Yeah, I was going to say, if they usually average 150, Genty will have about 200 yes. himself. I believe it. So that's the thing. I don't think they'll be able to stop him. So I think offensively we'll still be able to score points. Mm -hmm. I think you see us back in the 30s where we usually are. Uh, we didn't quite get there you know, last week. But yep. I think you see us back in the 30s. But here's where it's going to come down to can we stop UNLV's pass game. Mm -hmm. So I know we can score, but I don't know if we can stop their attack is the problem. Ricky White, 1,300 yards receiving this year. Uh, UNLV, they had a really good quarterback last year in Doug Brumfield, but they really identified a, a new, younger quarterback. Uh, he's only a redshirt freshman, and he has done an awesome job for this offense. Super efficient, has turned it over a few times this year, but for a kid his age, you, you would take it any day of the week. His quarterback efficiency rating, one of the best in the Mountain West Conference. Uh, he was the Mountain West freshman of the year. Certainly should have been in contention to be a first or second teamer at that position as well. There were just some some older guys that probably got a little more credit than, than he did. Uh, I, I think um, you're exactly right. This will be Boise State's best test against the pass in a little while now. I think I'd say since Washington. This is the best pass game. That or San Jose. Yeah. Similar to – I mean, I would say similar San to San Jose. Jose. And we saw how that first half went, man. I'm confident saying Ricky White will be the best receiver they face since that the, those UW yeah. receivers in the season opener. 1,300 yards? I mean, come on now. That's a lot. That's a lot. So how do they how do they find a way to effectively eliminate him from the game plan? How do they uh, confuse pressure, that, that young quarterback? Boise State's been yeah. dialing it up lately, man. Like I said, Andrew Simpson, Ahmed Hassanin, a guy we don't talk about a ton, but has three forced fumbles overall in the last two games. Braxton Feely. Mm -hmm. they're, they're starting to do some things up front where yeah. it's resembling those old Boise State defenses yep. where there, there's a number of guys that can can do some stuff that changed the game. Uh, Jaden Virgin, like, I mean, come on now. We're sending four and we're getting home, so. It's, it's hard to complain about that. I look at Jaden Virgin, and, and mostly it has to do with kind of his physique and the fact that he wears his old number 40. See a little Tyrone Crawford in him, a younger Tyrone Crawford that was, you know, he got to the NFL and he started to bulk up a little bit and mm -hmm. moved inside and things like yeah. that. But like that that early on uh, oh, yeah. Boise State Tyrone Crawford, there's a little bit of a resemblance there. Some athleticism in there. Big-time athleticism, big-time size, big-time ceiling. All right, we've reached the point. Um, it is prediction time. Boise State, a three-point favorite. The over-under on this thing, since you always ask me, I looked it up before the show. Uh, the over-under, 58. Oh, I thinking gonna you're going to guess. I was going to say 63. Okay. Right. The over-under, okay. 58. So so Vegas is thinking a, a final score somewhere, 30-27, 31-28 in favor of Boise State. That's interesting because I was going to say it's going to be 31-38. to 38. In favor of Boise State? Yeah. That's where I was at with it. I might have a little too much confidence right now, but I think it's going to be a little bit wider than that even. I, I'm going to go 34-24. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, and it might even be like a late score from UNLV that just kind of makes it look like the score is better. I, I have, I just have a lot of confidence right now. You at the practice, it's it, they're rejuvenated, they're energized, they are, they're practicing less, but yet they feel like they're getting more out of it. They're just being more t intentional, diligent in their in their process of practicing. They're not taking unnecessary hits. 
Um, anything like that. There's a lot of yellow jerseys out there at practice right now, too, for that matter, where, again, you can kind of just tell that there, there's a huge emphasis on, on keeping their bodies healthy for Saturday. That typically happens in Week 12. <laughs> week 12. Well, Shane, as always, it has been a blast. Championship week is here. I can't wait to get down to Las Vegas. I head out Thursday afternoon. Our coverage on KTVB will begin Thursday night. We'll continue Friday evening. There's a press conference that you can stream it live at KTVB.com uh, Friday afternoon. And then um, it is game day Saturday. We have a live pregame show that will be on Channel 7 from 9 to 10 a.m. And then we'll hit you back on our digital-only show from uh what would that be that would be uh noon to 1 p.m mountain time lee taking you up to kickoff of the 2023 mountain west conference championship game in las vegas shane it has been fun my man for sure Let's all right go broncos we'll see if they can get it done uh i will send you out on the guys uh in their excitement to play in an nfl venue and potentially redeem last year's loss in the mountain west conference championship game we appreciate you all of you this is jay sports bar serving the auto sports community yeah it's an awesome opportunity uh it'll be a great environment down there you know playing at legion stadium and i'm sure bronco nation will make the trip and we're fired up uh see a lot of blue down there uh, opportunity like no other i mean you dream about you know winning conferences, winning championships, and I mean, the opportunity's right there. So I know not just me, but everybody in this building is gonna do uh, whatever it takes to get it done.